Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today uh, for this webinar that is hosted by Jeffy, the Global Ethical Finance Initiative. Um, Jeffy is a nonprofit focused on delivering finance for positive change. And this talk is part of our Radical Old Idea series, and this is the first for this year. And the series gives a platform to ideas that challenge the ways in which we think about societies and economies. I'm delighted that today we will be speaking to Sir John Kay. He is one of Britain's leading economists and authors. Uh, he, his career has spanned the academic world, business, finance and public affairs. He's held chairs at the London Business School, the University of Oxford and the London School of Economics and is a fellow of St John's College at Oxford, where he began his academic career in 1970. He's also a fellow of the British Academy and the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And I'll be your interviewer for today. My name is Casey Rayner, and I work at A Future Worth Living in which provides consultancy services to the financial sector in navigating the very challenging path towards net zero. Um, if you have any questions for John, please do share them in the Q&A function and we'll save some time towards the end of this session for a Q&A. So get them in there and I will answer um, pose as many questions as possible. In addition to questions, you might um, want to join the debate uh, by tweeting uh, using the at sign finance for change. That's finance and then the number four and change or with the hashtag radical old idea or path to COP28. So without further ado, we're going to jump right in. And the focus of our conversation is going to be on John's most recent book. I hope you can all see that, that I'm holding up so it's shiny. Uh, wonderful book, great read, um, great big hefty topics for us to talk about today. So we're gonna kickstart with a conversation around the key concepts. Then, when, then we'll talk a little bit about uh, how that relates to some of the things that are going on in the world around us. Um, but without further ado, I want to pose to you, John, the fundamental question kind of covered in this book. Um, the title is Radical Uncertainty. And I wonder if you can just talk us through what is this concept of radical uncertainty and, and how is it different to what we might know in finance as risk? Right. We, I think, Casey, the best way to look at that is to uh, start with a historical perspective. It's really in the 17th century that people started talking for the first time about probabilities. It, it's, it has always puzzled me, uh, puzzled us, that it's so late in the history of economic thought that people came to talk about probabilistic reasoning. And the reason for that seems to be uh, that in the past, you didn't know what was going to happen in the future, but it was the, the will of the gods that decided what would happen in the future. And it was inappropriate uh, for you to think uh, that you could describe it in these sorts of ways. But people did start to use probabilistic type reasoning, and they extended it through um, life expectancy, controlling industrial processes, brewing was where it began, actually. And by the beginning of the 20th century, uh, probabilities and probabilistic reasoning was being quite widely employed. Not yet in the financial sector, that came a bit later. If I go back almost exactly a century, there were two books published in 1920 that were um, critical of all of this, of the extension of probabilistic reasoning. And they tried to argue that there should be a distinction between what they called risk, which could be described probabilistically, uh, and uncertainty, which couldn't be, be handled in that kind of way. But interestingly, that argument was lost. And if we look at the financial world today, not only is probabilistic reasoning very widely used, but people equate risk and uncertainty. They're used interchangeably, these words, and they're equated with volatility. So risk, uncertainty, and asset volatility all meet, 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 mean much the same thing. Mervyn and I decided we think that's not a helpful way of, uh, of approaching all of this. We'd like to restore a distinction between risk and uncertainty. And if people, you talk to people in ordinary language, 
they're rather clear there's a difference between risk and uncertainty. Uncertainty is something that can be good or bad. You go to a new place, a new restaurant, a new um, a place to go on holiday, you're uncertain about what you will experience. You meet new people, that might be better than you expect, it might be worse than you expect, it's uncertain. But risk is always something bad. Uh, no one ever says, uh, there's a risk I might win the national lottery. They don't even say there's a risk I might not win the national lottery, because they don't really expect to win the national lottery. Risk is a risk is something um, uh, uncertain to, uh, is, is that kind of um, uh, a failure to meet what are, are your reasonable expectations. So if I start from here, I don't know how long it will take me to drive to Manchester. Uh, I can go and look it up and I discover it might take two and a half hours if I look on ways or something like that. And that's a resolvable uncertainty. And I know roughly how long it's going to take. I think about driving to our house in, in the country. I know how long it takes. It takes about an hour and a quarter. Sometimes it's an hour and 20 minutes. Sometimes it's an hour and 10 minutes. I can construct a, a distribution round about that. Now, and sometimes something goes wrong. There's a traffic jam. There's an accident on the motorway. My car breaks down. That's a risk. So that we have uh, uncertainty, which is resolvable, either by looking it up or by defining a probability distribution. And then there's risk, which is something that derails your reasonable expectations about what's going to happen. So that's the way in which we we want to look at risk and uncertainty. And it says that if you think of it in that way, and this was what motivated us in the first place, there was a lot of um, inappropriate reliance on risk models in the lead up to the financial crisis of 2007-8. And a lot of that continues today. Thank you for that whistle stop tour through um, such a big, concept and, and certainly a challenge to how we might have incorrectly thought about things previously. I wonder, um, you talked a little bit there about resolvable uncertainty. Is, is all uncertainty resolvable? No, absolutely not. Most uncertainty is not resolvable. Resolvable uncertainties are ones where you can either get more information and that resolves it. Um, or you can define a probability distribution. But mostly you can't define a probability distribution uh, and different people would estimate. If they think about probabilities distribution, probability distributions at all, different people would describe different probab probability distributions. Uh, it's framed by people who advocate this kind of extended probabilistic reasoning. It's uh, <coughs> very well expressed uh, well expressed, at least, by Milton Friedman, who said, um, who noted that Frank Knight, who was his predecessor at Chicago, made a distinction between risk and uncertainty. And Knight, Friedman then said, I shall not refer again to this distinction, because I do not think it is valid. We may treat people as they attach probabilities to every conceivable event. But people don't attach pro probabilities to every conceivable event, and they shouldn't. There's a betting shop just along from my office, and every day I pass it, and it gives me the odds of various uh, 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 on various horses and various races. I don't have probabilities of that Dobbin will win the three thirty at Kempton Park. I would never dream of passing the shop and saying, hmm, I think um, their probability differs from mine. I'll go in and place a bet on that. We don't have probabilities for every conceivable event for two very good reasons that the race at Kempton Park uh, makes out. Firstly, I don't know anything about horses and racing. <laughs> uh, 
and it would be silly for me to formulate probabilities. And secondly, there are people who know a great deal more than I do, and I would be pitching myself against them if I expressed a probability. So most people don't have probabilities of most things. That's just not the way people think, and it's actually not the way people should think. So then with uncertainty, let's use your example there of traveling. Um, if I'm thinking about traveling from where I am, Edinburgh, for example, down to uh, somewhere I haven't been before, then the time that it takes to travel there is uncertain. I can resolve some of that by looking it up, figuring out um, using a map how long it might take me. And then there are things that could derail that. So those are the risks that this expectation is not met. Uh, and I can get my head around that. So um, what might be some of the different real world examples of uncertainty that's not resolvable? Is it is it simply down to um, that nobody's done it before, that there's, there's no more knowledge to be had, or is there something else um, that informs something that is un an unresolvable uncertainty? Uh, well, the outcome of the war in Ukraine, for example, falls mm. into that category. It's not resolvable. We can't frame a probability distribution about it, and we can't go and look up some book that tells us what's going to happen. Uh, the world is full in this sense of um, uh, uh, uncertainties that aren't resolvable. Most uncertainties aren't resolvable. And we made a large part of the explanation of the financial crisis was that people believed that a group of uncertainties that were not resolvable could be resolved by describing probability distributions. We actually begin the book with a couple of examples, one of which is David Vignard, who was then CFO of Goldman Sachs, saying we've experienced 25 standard deviation events several days in a row. Well, you don't have to know anything about statistics. <laughs> to know that you won't experience 25 standard deviation events several days in a row. What we meant, and what I, I hope he understood, was that he was dealing with events which were just outside the scope of the Goldman Sachs models. They believed they could resolve these uncertainties, and they couldn't. I think there's something fundamental in human nature, isn't there, about wanting to control and, and quantify. And so there is perhaps this human bias towards believing things that are deeply uncertain can be managed um, and, and quantified. And, and perhaps that narrows our vision. Um, what might it, and you, you do touch on, on some of this, but I wonder if you can share some of your insights with our listeners around how do we avoid this kind of human bias towards um, trying to quantify everything? And, and how do we embrace this uncertainty in practice? Um, I'm not sure there's a human bias towards wanting to quantify things. There's certainly a bias on, on, on the part of economists and consultants in terms of wanting to quantify things. But I think most people are quite comfortable with the idea that quite a lot of things can't be quantified. What I think they're less comfortable with is, is the idea that there are lots of things that they just don't know, that they, they want uncertainties to be resolvable, and many of them aren't. And is there something um, that we can do in finance uh, to help ourselves accept that? I guess... Um, when I'm thinking about some of the processes that we use in finance, it, it, it's um, there's a deep desire to put everything into a model, uh, much like some of the climate stress testing that the colleagues in finance have undertaken. Um, we'll try and parameterize everything. There's very little space in processes for this natural uncertainty to exist. Um, other particular methods um, that can allow this kind of uncertainty to exist uh, but still give insights into um, the types of things you might want to consider? I, I think the, there are a great many and it's easy for what I'm saying to sound as if I'm against, I'm against building models. <laughs> I'm absolutely not against building models. I've spent a fair part of my life building models of various kinds. 
Uh, but what models are a way of organizing thought and argument. They're not a way of telling you what's going to happen. And that that's what uh, people are very reluctant to understand and need to. Mo models are immensely useful, but as ways of helping us think about problems. I, from time to time, I talk to audiences about uh, various scenarios and it never happens without someone coming up at the end and saying, so which of these scenarios do you think is going to happen? And of course, my answer is, uh, I don't think any of these scenarios are going to happen. I was positing these scenarios as a way for us to organize a discussion. I think that's a, a really interesting point. And in the back of the book, so there's a great discussion. It's very well structured all the way through throughout the book. But the section that I think was super helpful was this kind of practical application section. So there's this piece on living with uncertainty. I think it's part part five, part five in the book, living with uncertainty and embracing uncertainty. And there's a quote here, which I think um, relates back to your point on, on models in the, the a map or a model is just a necessary <clears throat> simplification um, and the map is not the territory. And I, I think that's a really interesting piece, particularly when we start thinking about climate change, you can't model your way into this different future, but you can start to think about potential different futures, recognizing <clears throat> that actually maybe none of them will manifest, but perhaps in understanding some of those attributes of the future, it starts to help you figure out how you will remain resilient and robust in the face of these uncertainties. And I wonder if you maybe wanted to touch on that kind of concept around building resilience and robustness in the face of uncertainties. It's certainly something that we in the finance sector are you know, really struggling with. How do we navigate these different potential futures in a sensible way? Yeah, there are two issues there. What one is the map and the territory, and um, mm. uh, the map is not the territory. Is something when I discovered that it was initially formulated by a Polish philosopher whose name I'm afraid I can't pronounce, but it's a very deep insight, and it's illustrated beautifully in the Borges story. It's actually quite an old story, but he told it particularly well of the quest to build the most perfect map of the world. And of course, the most perfect map of the world replicates the world and is therefore completely useless. Maps, mm. the whole point of maps is that they're simplifications. And more than that, um, if you're what simplificate what map you want, what simplification you want, depends on the purpose for work, uh, for which you're going to use it. Uh, a nice illustration is the tube map of London. Mm. it's really good for navigating your way around the tube. If you're wanting to walk around London, then a tube map is a, a very unsatisfactory way to do it. And I have a lovely example from my personal experience of using the tube to get from Paddington State, this was before I knew London well, of using the tube to get from Paddington Station to some people who lived in Hyde Park Gardens. And I asked, uh, what's the nearest tube station to you? And they told me Lancaster Gate. So I got the tube from Paddington Station to Lancaster Gate, which means you travel about a mile and a half um, uh, west, and then you get onto another line and travel a mile and a half east. Mm -hmm. And if you walk, it's about a couple of hundred yards. It's, it's a great map, but it's a great map for a particular purpose. And that's true of all maps. You'll um, use a different map if you're driving from if you're walking and so on. And that's true of models, that uh, models are really useful, uh, but models are developed for particular purposes and should be developed with particular purposes in mind. Yeah, I think that comes back to um, in the book, there's this element of making sure that the information that you're bringing into your kind of consideration is <coughs> relevant to the question that you're asking. Um, so you can overload yourself with data, probabilities, etc. But if they're not actually helping you drive 
to a deeper understanding of your question, they can in fact kind of lead you off on a completely different path, much like um, heading east to head west to eventually get back to where you were. Um, I wonder if there's something that you want to say about that in terms of your experience in academia and, and finance. Um, perhaps a health warning to those of us on the call on the webinar today. Um, how, how does one go about figuring out which tools are the right tools in answering the question that you're confronted with? Um, there's really quite a lot of judgment and experience about that. You know, how do I know now uh, that the way to get from Paddington Station to Hyde Park Gardens is to walk? I know that because I've lived in London for quite a long time and I've acquired a general knowledge of London geography that enables me to find the right map for a particular purpose. So um, if one goes back to the stories of the financial crisis, it was that really what a lot of what was happening was the judgment and experience of, um, uh, of bankers was replaced by professional risk modeling. And there was, the, there was a role for the kind of risk models that were developed, uh, but it couldn't take the place of, um, of judgment and experience. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, every situation, including that one, is to some degree um, is to some degree unique. The other thing we haven't talked about, which came up a few moments ago, and I should elaborate on, is um, the key to dealing with risk in terms of robustness and resilience. If we're saying the world is full of um, uncertainty that isn't resolvable, then we have to cope with how we manage risks in that kind of world. And these are the two key words for me, robustness and resilience. You're trying to devise strategies uh, that are resilient. That is, they're not too vulnerable to risk and they're robust so mm. that uh, they can recover uh, from events that you, you won't expect. And uh, modularity and redundancy are very important contributors to that. Modularity means that if part of the system fails, it doesn't make the whole system fail. Uh, redundancy means you don't build in the minimum tolerances, uh, which uh, you think you might be able to get away with. And if we think back of the last 50 years of the financial sector in particular, and business more generally, we've tended to regard um, modularity and redundancy as indications of inefficiency. Mm -hmm. they're, they're the things to be driven up. They're, they're not, they're what, they're what you need in order to establish these robust and resilient strategies. And one of the things I hope we learned during the pandemic was um, the importance of robustness and resilience the difficulties which supply chains, for example, had with dealing with um, events. And uh, I was gonna say events that couldn't have been predicted, but that's that's a good discussion we, we, we might have about. I think that's a nice takeaway, but I did wanna pick up. So for those of you listening just now, if you're making notes, now is the time to write down those four words. So um, that kind of robust and resilient um, the modularity element, how do we start to think about that in terms of, and you're quite right, I, I, we have driven out um, a lot of this redundancy from our systems in the belief that in order to optimize returns, in order to optimize our society and to make it more efficient, everything needs to be just in time um, and that you end up with these very fragile kind of supply chains. And you're right, in, in COVID times, we really saw that come to come to bear. Um, also in particular with the energy crisis. So I hope you've written down those words. And in thinking about how we might address some of the unfolding crises, how do we start to question um, what does good look like? Is it about being super efficient? Is it about building robust and resilient systems? 
as opposed to these just-in-time models that have kind of underpinned management thinking um, over the last 50 years or so. And I think that's one of those big ideas, those radical ideas around how we've organized ourselves previously and, and how we might need to think about organizing ourselves in the future. But yeah, you started to touch on, on the pandemic and we've obviously had, we're lurching from one crisis to another. The, the key word at Davos was polycrisis. Um, they're manifesting themselves at an alarming rate. And we always seem to be confronted with once in a 100 year event every five years, whether that temperatures or weather events, um, so maybe, yeah, let's let's jump into the pandemic. Was that predictable? Was it um, an uncertainty that could be resolved or not? How do we kind of frame this thinking? And and I wonder if you might as well, um, from the pandemic, kind of stretch into the war on Ukraine and, and war in Ukraine and your, your thoughts on that topic. Yeah, uh, the pandemic, interestingly, we say on, on the book, I think it's about page 40 for people who have a copy. I hope everyone will have a copy by the end of this talk, uh, that it is likely that the world will, will be affected uh, by a virus which does not yet, by some contagious virus that is not does not yet exist. Uh, we certainly didn't know it probably actually did exist by the time we were writing that particular um, that, that that particular story uh, or these particular lines. But the the pandemic was an event that will happen from time to time. It's an event that was, in a sense, likely. Uh, uh, but the, uh, you couldn't attach a probability to that. It would be absurd to say uh, in 2017, there's a probability of something or other that a novel virus will break out in Wuhan in late 2019. You can't, you can't attach probabilities in that kind of way. There's a di di distinction there which people elide too much between between what is likely and what is probable. Thing, likelihood is about what can happen given my general knowledge of the world. Probability is about attaching some kind of number to that likelihood. And both the pandemic and the war in Ukraine are events that are in this sense likely, uh, but you can't attach probabilities to them. And that takes you back to thinking about uh, robustness and resilience. That uh, if someone asks me, so so when is the war and going? Uh, when is the pandemic going to happen? I can't give an answer to that, but I can say that pandemics will happen, and we need to create both health systems and supply chains that are robust and resilient to that. So I'm going to just ask you to move on a little bit to, to the war in Ukraine. And I see there's some questions coming through um, in the Q&A function. So I'll take a quick look at those. But I wonder um, if, if you may touch on Ukraine. Was Is this something that was predictable? Is it something that you could have put a probability to, given everything that we knew about um, some of the political tensions? Or again, is it one of those ones that was um, uncertain and you could say that uh, it was likely, but you couldn't necessarily attach a probability to it? Yeah, you, you could say that an, an event of that kind was likely and the world will be affected by geopolitical events from time to time. Uh, but to go back to my that rather foolish quote of Friedman's earlier, uh, people attach probabilities to every conceivable event. Well, uh, if you don't attach a probability to Putin will decide in February 2022 to invade Ukraine. And actually, um, the Friedman idea is that people are willing to take bets on every possible event. Mm -hmm. That you can, the way you find out the probability is you say, would you take odds of 10 to one on this? No, I say no. How about 50 to one? You say yes. But um, you don't do that for good reasons, as I was describing earlier about the, the betting shop. If someone says to me, me uh, I bet you something or other, 
that Putin will invade Ukraine. I wonder what does that person know that I don't? I don't know if you've ever watched the uh, Marlon Brando in the film yeah. Guy Knowles. Yeah. And there's a wonderful scenario in that in which um, uh, Brando says, a long time ago, my father said to me, this is a guy who's a professional gambler. My father said to me, um, um, someday uh, someone will come up to you and say, uh, I am going to uh, take, take a bet on the probability that I can uh, pull a card out of here and uh, uh, someone will squirt cider in your ear. <laughs> so Daddy said, do not take that bet because <laughs> you're sure as hell that you'll end up with an ear full of cider. <laughs> so some of the questions I'm gonna pose to you. So thank you so much to the team in the background who are starting to group some of these questions together by theme. Um, so maybe touch on robustness and resilience first. And I think from Colin, we have a comment rather than a question, which is redundancy, that is spare capacity and modularity seem very relevant to efficiency for the UK NHS system. I don't know if you want to get dragged into a debate on the NHS and how it might um, adopt some of these models. But the other question we have, which is um, quite more specific is, John, do you have any advice on how to estimate or judge the balance um, between resilience and robustness and efficiency on the other hand? Um, how might you go about doing that? I think in a way, these are, these are the same question. Mm -hmm. And uh, deciding what you mean by efficiency in this sense, because efficiency means actually a degree of robustness and resilience. Mm. I was always struck by a conversation I had with a guy who's head of one of the privatized water companies soon after privatization. And it ran something like this. Um, he said, you know, almost everyone in this business is employed either to prevent things going wrong or to fix them once they have. So if I were to fire everyone, you know, for the next three months, uh, we'd save massively on costs and nobody would notice the difference. <laughs> um, and that, 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 that's right in an organization like, in, in a network organization like that. People are there either to stop things going wrong or to fix them once they have. And he said, and what that means and the way privatization will work, will work out, is that we'll be constantly told to reduce costs in this business by reducing the number of people who are either stopping things going wrong or fixing them. And then somewhat in some company, it will go too far and some disaster will happen. And then what we'll see is resources being thrown at putting mm -hmm. the lines. And interestingly, that didn't happen. It wasn't in water that happened. It was really in rail track that that happened. Uh, that they, they produced this kind of imagined greater efficiency. Something went wrong. Uh, the Hatfield crash was the was the main trigger uh, and then the whole system unwound after that so it's a matter of it's a matter of difficult fine judgment and mm -hmm. I'm rather uh, we relied on experienced engineers uh, than on regulators and uh, financiers for making these kind of decisions that plays very nicely into um, a series of questions that we have on, on climate change. So, you know, climate change, uh, and I'm going to say it's a massive risk, but I, I, let's come on to whether climate change is an uncertainty, resolvable or not, or, or a risk. Um, but one of the questions we have here is, do you think central banks have appropriate resilience in terms of moving to net zero and green finance? And I wonder if maybe in this concept of climate change, you want to unpick where does where does the concept of climate change and and the realization of maybe a, a three degree world where does that sit? Is that is that an uncertainty? Is it a risk, or is it a bit of both? Um, well, there's clearly 
enormous uncertainty about climate futures. Mm. And there are many risks about climate futures. Um, so that things can be, there's uncertainty, things can be better or worse than you expect. And there are risks in that things can go badly wrong. So both of these concepts are relevant and models are relevant, but I, I worry that people take them much too seriously. Their ways of thinking about alternatives and scenarios, they're not ways of making decisions. Mm. And as for central banks, well, I'm not sure central banks have, if I was looking for institutions to help tackle climate change, central banks would be pretty far down the list of ones which I'd, I'd want to consult or involve. I think there's, a, there's another question in here around the capital requirements for major banks around net zero. Um, so do you think the concerns around capital requirements for major banks around net zero legislation is justified? And are they preparing effectively for this legislation? Um, I think much like the Solvency 2 elements and stress tests and, and holding capital to protect against risk events, um, are we thinking about this in the right way? And, and are the capital requirements um, required, sufficient, um, or, or, or are they going too far? Um, I think I, I'm unhappy about the whole concept of regulatorily imposed capital requirements. Um, having seen what, I mean, if we go back to that 2008 financial crisis, a lot of the problem was that people, uh, we had overspecified regulatory models and people regarded regulatory capital requirements uh, not as a minimum, which of course they were, but as a maximum. That is, this goes back to redundancy and it, it exemplifies the issue of redundancy. Uh, I don't know what how much capital a bank needs. I don't think anyone knows how, how much capital a bank needs. Uh, the answer is basically a lot. And uh, uh, once again, I, I would look and rely on experienced bankers. I, as you know, I grew up as a schoolboy in Edinburgh uh, quite a long time ago. And then my school contemporaries, the ones who weren't going to get good enough grades to go to good universities, but the people who would go and join the Bank of Scotland and the Royal Bank, and after 20 years, they'd expect to become bank managers. And they actually managed the risks associated with banking pretty well. No Scottish bank went bust in the, in the 19th century. Um, in the 20th century, rather, we didn't have to go very far into the 21st century before two of them did, because then they were run by people with MBAs from good business schools, uh, mm -hmm. by people who were employing uh, sophisticated professional risk managers. And these much cleverer people manage the situation much worse uh, <laughs> than... Um, schoolboys who didn't manage to follow me to university. Oh, it's a provocation. Hello, Casey, are you there? Apologies, we, we appear to have uh, briefly lost Casey there, so I'll just um, step in and uh, continue asking um, some of these questions to John. We've got one from Colin McCulloch who asks, um, does this kind of principal distinction between risk and uncertainty mean that some possible events are uninsurable? Um, yes, some events are uninsurable. Um, uh, in fact, quite a lot are uninsurable because really to, to make something insurable, you either need to have a basis for calculating a probability distribution uh, in the way you do in gambling contexts, for example, or you need to have a series of observations uh, which enable you to price a risk appropriately. Uh, the phrase black swan from Nassim Taleb is used quite a lot in this context. But I think we should be clear 
what a black swan is that uh, the black swan the, the the metaphor is of people not knowing until australia was colonized uh, that there could be black swans so uh, a black swan is an event that you can't predict or ensure or uh, take steps against because you can't imagine it till it's happened um what I like to use is to say no one could talk about the probability of inventing the wheel, because if you could imagine a uh, probability of inventing a wheel, you have already invented the wheel. And there are a lot of there are a lot of things in the world that are fundamentally uncertain like that. Uh, there's also the um, the risk or what people think of as long tail risks, the things that can happen. But I'm very unlikely to happen, you know, like, you know, tossing a coin a hundred times and getting ahead every time. Of course, if that happened, there's an alternative explanation to I've just experienced a 25 standard deviation event, which which is a lot more likely. This is back to people. Uh, we have limited information and the information we have is distributed very unevenly. Reminds me slightly of the story about a mathematician coming to work and, and somebody said to him, oh, I, I saw a car with a number plate that perfectly spelled out my name today. What are the chances of that? And the mathematician said, well, pretty much the chances of seeing any given number plate on any given day. Yeah. But, you know, only some of them appear as kind of notable to us. A slightly different uh, meaning there. I see yeah. Casey's back, so I will uh, just set, step off. We've just discussed Colin's question, so I, I think maybe... Uh, John uh, Sturrock's one about whether these uh, risks, uh, whether this idea of risk and uncertainty is understood by uh, by policymakers, and and if if not, how can we how can we get this uh, this concept better understood? Yeah, I'm I'm not sure it is very well understood by policymakers, and I think what we uh, we need to politician we we need to create a world in what, which politicians can say. I don't know, because the nature of the discussion we have is that there are going to be a lot of things that we don't know. And politicians are unfortunately expected to pretend to know um, almost everything. So I hope we'll sell lots of books. I think that's the main <laughs> mechanism I can think of as uh, trying to improve that situation. Minister, I don't know if, if you can all hear me and if I'm hopefully back with you. Um, is is there something that you can do in terms of bringing this knowledge to policymakers? Is there something when for those of us giving advice um, to policymakers, is there something we need to be doing in our framing to kind of bring to life that there is kind of the known and measurable, but actually we need to leave space in the discussion for all the unknowns? Um, and all the elements of uncertainty, perhaps that then starts to give politicians the space to step into, well, actually, these are the things we know and we can manage, and, and these are the things that actually we don't know, but we need to prepare for anyway. Um, and I suppose that question is similar for those in big financial organisations, if you're an actuary or if you're in the risk function, maybe it's not just about the risks you can manage and measure maybe it's about those elements of uncertainty that need to be accounted for but can't necessarily have a probability attached to them maybe we need to be more generous um with our conversations around these yes and we uh we naturally think in terms of stories rather than um mm. rather than numbers actually and that's true when you push people even of people who um uh even of people who are engaged professionally in these kinds of in these kind of activities that humans are natural storytellers and that's um, the way in which people frame their thinking and it's the best way of getting ideas across but that's back to resisting the idea that we can quantify everything although uh Quantification can be a way of um, uh, of storytelling. It's back to the point I made earlier that the use of models is not in the main as ways of predicting what's going to happen. It's a way of 
helping organize and frame your thoughts and expectations about what's going to happen. So I think I'm going to um, bring a little quote in here again, but from the practical knowledge section. So for those of you who have yet to go and buy the book, go do that, have a read. And then I would encourage you to think about how you take some of these concepts into your day to day working lives. Uh, but one of the, the comments here, and I, I don't think it was necessarily related to climate change, but it's one that for me um, really rings true, is that now humans face complex problems um, and they're very different from the problems that we've encountered in previous historic periods and I think one of the things that you're talking about with creating stories and narratives is it, traditionally our models have related back to what has happened in the past and how do we use the past to predict the future and that will only get us so far if we're expecting the future to be radically different from what we have faced previously. Um, so for me, um, the big the big kind of takeaways are around the three R's, um, resilience, robustness, oh, I've forgotten the other one, um, redundancy and, and modularity, but also how do we bring in storytelling? So moving away from this kind of mathematically driven decision-making model and approach um, to a much broader story-based narrative that brings in those building blocks that perhaps previously might have seen been seen as elements of failure, but actually help us face a very uncertain future with more um, probability of navigating it successfully. Is there anything else, John, that you would say um, for practitioners out there in the finance world, is there anything else that they need to be um, focusing on when they read your book um, to take into their daily lives? Well, I think I think you've been reasserting, and I would want to reassert too, these key points of uh, our, our knowledge of the future is inevitably limited. We need robustness and resilience, and that's true whether we're talking about our financial system, our business supply chains, or our political systems. And modularity and redundancy are keys to achieving that. There's another mantra which I would like people to take away from this kind of thinking, which is um, uncertain, uncertainty is good. Uncertainty is what creates opportunities for people, make new inventions, make profits, financial instruments, whatever it might be. Uncertainty is good. If you manage risk, you can embrace uncertainty. A world without uncertainty would be... Uh, very boring. We use the example of film Groundhog Day, which many people will have seen, where Bill Murray is compelled to repeat the same day over and over again. And in the end, this is so boring, he tries to commit suicide, but he can't do that because that isn't in the, in the plot. Uh, we, need, uh, we need uncertainty. Uncertainty is what makes life worthwhile or rather it's very boring if we don't have it it's what makes business interesting it's what gives people in finance opportunities to make profits but you can only benefit from uncertainty if you manage risk and that's that's the central thesis which i think we'd like to put across to people great to bring that positive perspective in as we start kind of coming into a close. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left. So if there are any pressing questions, now's the time to get them in. Uh, but I did want to touch just very briefly on that, the, the piece on opportunities. So um, I'm going to get this quote wrong. There, there was, there's often quoted this piece, I think it was from horse and cart owners who were absolutely certain that the horse and cart was the only mode of transportation. Um, and much like those horse and cart owners, we see fossil fuel companies and autos um, in, in much the same position. But it's this uncertainty about the future world that gives us hope that we can solve some of our, our greatest challenges, because indeed the horse and cart were, are, are no longer the favoured mode of transportation. They have been overtaken by cars and, and EVs are snapping at the heels of um, internal combustion engines. So then I guess the takeaway for many of us 
in our working lives is, yes, we need to manage risk, but how do we create space for different narratives about the future and how do we identify those opportunities? And do they also align with creating robust, resilient systems um, to help us manifest those opportunities? Let me just see if we've got any final questions. Um, are, oh, no, that's not a full question. Da, 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 da. Think any closing words from you, John, while I flick through? Oh, no, we've got loads of big questions. Um, one last one. Have you seen any particular companies or industries that are good examples of how to make oneself more robust against risk and uncertainty? I see one of the questions we have takes the examples of the airline industry. And I think there's an awful lot we can learn for finance from airlines. There's the um, there's the positive thing in particular from that is the creation in that area of a so-called just culture, which recognizes that people make mistakes and they're not only, they're positively encouraged to report mistakes so that people can learn from them. And that is so different from the world we're in in finance uh, as to be almost indescribably different. Uh, but it means, uh, it means that if things go wrong in the aviation industry, people, um, uh, uh, there's a sharing of knowledge and experience that helps protect us against, um, against things in the future with the overall result that flying is, um, is actually incredibly safe. There's also, of course, a story there, uh, which is really the decline of Boeing, which is back to what we were describing earlier about eliminating or reducing robustness and resilience uh in with a view to its effect on cost cutting and um, there are a lot of lessons there uh in that boeing story and back to my water company example and so often we need to recognize that robustness resilience redundancy modularity are really important to managing business effectively and are particularly important in finance. Great notes for us to, to come to a close. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure, uh, Sir John, talking to you about the concepts in your new book. Again, I will flash this up. But this is not the only book that um, Sir John has written. There are many others. One of my favourites, and um, for those of you, I think there was a question about young bankers, and um, for those of you looking for career development thoughts, um, I would highly recommend this book, um, Obliquity, around how sometimes the straight and narrow path is not the best path to get where you're hoping to go. Um, there's many others, um, which I haven't been able to pull off the bookshelf in time, but do have a look because you've got a, a wonderful kind of array of um, thoughts in your, your different books. I wonder uh, if you might end on, is there a unifying theme to your work to date? What is it that has, you, your books have different flavors, but there's often a very coherent voice through them. What is What has been your unifying theme for the messages that you've brought to the masses through your publications? I think Casey, in a way it's you, obliquity that is the underlying theme, uh, that we live in a world where we, we know less about it than we think we do. And uh, I was brought up as a theoretical economist believing that people optimized everything, maximized utility, maximized profits. When I went out in the real world, I discovered that most people weren't actually maximizing anything. <laughs> For good reason, they don't know how to maximize anything. We don't have that kind of information. What people are trying to do is to cope with an uncertain world. And I think, if there's a single theme of everything I've written in quite different areas over the last uh, 25 years, that would be it. Thank you very much. So great book to read. Also, the review on markets and the purpose of finance.
um, and how short termism might be undermining the more effective role of capital allocation is another one to add to your reading list if you haven't read it already. But that's enough homework for everyone. I'd like to thank you all for coming today to listen to this conversation. This was the first in our series of the Radical Old Idea for 2023. We'll be back in um, May later on with another session and we'll be sending out more information about the topic and key speakers in due course. In the interim, if you're interested in finding out more about the work of the Global Ethical Finance Initiative, you can have a look at the website, which is globalethicalfinance.org. You can also find all the different videos from our previous events on the website and also more information about projects such as the SDG Investment Products Platform and also the path to COP28. So that's the next COP that is happening this year in Dubai, and there is a dedicated website path to cop28.com if you want to find out more as always loads of information on the website uh and do get in contact if there's any particular speakers you'd like to hear from we'd love to hear your thoughts but thank you so much for joining us today and sir john Kay, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and it was a pleasure to speak to you good to talk to you casey thank you goodbye speak to you soon